And uh, we kick off with Jasmine Plummer, who is the director of the Center for Spatial Omics at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. With a PhD in medical genetics and vast experience in genomics, single cell technologies, and spatial omics, she's uniquely qualified for her talk today of integrative genomics in single cell and spatial modeling of disease. Jasmine, please start. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, I just wanted to say thank you for having me, and I wish that I was there in person to hear all the talks live and see all the wonderful science that is going on in the Netherlands, but hopefully next year I will be able to attend. Um, and today I'm going to take you through and walk you through a little bit about how we're thinking about um, the idea of really integrating the multi-omic approaches that have been talked about earlier today, specifically in single cell and spatial. And so it, one of the things that I really am interested in is kind of the idea of how does disease start? So as a trained geneticist, we used to think about it in the sense of we didn't have these canonical mutations like BRCA1, but in neurodevelopmental disorders, you can kind of see it in a family where one person, as I show over here, may be affected, but it might skip generations and it might not be even the same disease. So in one person here, maybe schizophrenia or um, this gentleman over here may have bipolar and these children over here may have autism. And so that becomes a really um, difficult problem to really understand what the mutational load would be. Um, and one way that really astounded me in the field is that it really is obviously a brain disorder, um, but if you take something very simplistic to that, so if a gene is being not turned on in the right time in the right place, and that's why we're getting kind of the discrepancy in how a genetic hit may turn up in a family. This experiment's really interesting in the sense that they took up, um, they mushed up places of the frontal cortex and the temporal cortex. So these are parts of the brain that are affected in these kind of disorders. So in this case, autism. And what you can say very simplistically, if you mush up this place and you mush up this place, there are genes in blue and in red that define the frontal cortex. You, this is what it takes to be a frontal cortex or this part of the brain. And this is what it takes to be a temporal cortex. But the interesting thing in these disorders is that you've lost that regulation. So you really lost the kind of boundaries of the genes that go up and the genes that go down. So it's really the genes being in the right place at the right time. And so when you look at this kind of from a genetic perspective, these are all kind of individual genes in these bubbles. And in the yellow here, I'm just denoting certain um, disorders. So in this case, syndromic neurodevelopmental disorders, in this case, autism. And what I hope you can appreciate is that there's a lot of overlap. So genes that may be kind of receptor tyrosine kinases or other genes that are totally um, not related to that, like chromatin modifiers, are still interconnected in the types of diseases that they hit. And again, going back to that idea, it's probably that they're being regulated in the right place in the right time. So we kind of took this, um, this is the multiomic approach, we kind of took these genes and set them up in um, to try and discover really if it is the, not necessarily the type of gene you are, but how you're being regulated. Um, and so we did a, a simplistic math problem here. So gene one um, is kind of, one of those disorder genes, same with gene two, gene three, and gene four. These are all kind of demarcated by colors. And so the idea for a gene regulatory network in this sense is to say, who binds gene one? So this blue guy, this transcription vector binds gene one here, but it also binds gene three and also binds gene seven over here. And what you can see is we can start to build that model. So that one binds itself, but it also binds eight and seven. And over time, when you do this through the entire um, genome, you start to see atlases like this. So you start to see connections in these hubs. And what I really like about this is that it really depicts kind of this genetic disorder um, map where we can kind of see that these things are connected, even though we wouldn't normally connect them because they're being connected by the, the places that be, they're being regulated. And so the way we really did this, so this is actually um, the screen itself, is it's a robotic screen. So essentially we took 50, almost 1500 transcription factors and you can see here they're laid out in quads. We use a robot to do this. And the nice kind of molecular trick that we use here is a HIS and LAC-Z tag. So we literally take um, the gene itself. So the neurodevelopmental disorder gene would be in green. And then we tag um, HIS and uh, LAC-Z. So anytime any of these transcription factors bind to it, we'll get either positive, we'll get positive 
um, and negative regulators because of the idea that we've kind of put this molecular trick that you'll turn on. So irregardless if you're a negative regulator, as long as you bind um, and we can select for HIS or LACZ, um, then we should see that you have an interaction. And so what we really have done instead of kind of the transcription factor center approach, which is CHIP-seq, right? So chip seeks like if you have CHD8, which is a, um, a chromatin modifier, and you want to know everything CHD8 binds to, that's a really great approach. But in our case, we had a lot of genes that are not connected. And how do we connect them by their um, gene regulatory networks? And so what you can see here, this is essentially one of the genes. And then you'll see that it gets baited against um, the transcription factors and the guys that turn on, so they glow, um, and they're also blue, are positive hits. So what did that look like? Um, it's a ginormous data set. So you can see that even uh, we took about 50 gene, right? So we took a subset of that larger um, neurodevelopmental disorder network. And you can see here that all the yellows are those neurodevelopmental disorder genes, and all the blues are all the possible transcription factors that can turn it on. Um, and when you take that network, so do we believe what we're seeing? We actually took a bulk seek approach in the beginning. So we looked, we took an Allen Brain data um, database. So it has RNA seek across um, the entire developing brain over time. And this is a really collapsed version of expression, but we can see um, expression is kind of turned on to some level in all places of the brain throughout development. When we take um, those neurodevelopmental disorder genes, so that's these 42 promoters. Um, you can see we can actually get further down into different layers of the brain. So what this tells to non-brain people is that there is some kind of specificity in just being a neurodevelopmental disorder gene, which makes sense, um, right? Because it's affecting the brain. But you can't really get this, um, this region right here, cerebellum, which really lights up. It's like sitting on the outside edge. But what we can't get to are kind of these inner regions, which are regions that are like deeper into the cortex where we know that the, uh, deeper into the brain where we know these disorders affect. But if we take those transcription factors, so remembering just the transcription factors from the gene regulatory network that we've now created for neurodevelopmental disorders, you can see what right now, just in bulk RNA-seq data, that we can really drill down and get almost to the hippocampus. Um, so really we can start to tune into like, we know that one, that it's specific, and two, that we can try to see regions that we wouldn't have seen before. So we really like this approach. You take bulk sometimes to kind of see the network and see where you're at. Um, but really thinking about how do people go from bulk to single cell to spatial, which some of the talks today are actually presenting as well, is that especially for the brain, bulk data is great to give you an idea, especially for like case versus control. But the sense of single cell really tells you, you know, in the brain, a GABAergic cell is really important. So you can look at a TCNE plot, which have been presented today and say like, oh, we have more yellow cells than more blue, and maybe that's how the disorder happens. But what we really would love to see is like, how is that connected, right? In the brain, it really matters if a yellow is living next to a blue. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we chose spatial. So this is kind of just to the broader context of the audience is um, kind of the ideas of what's happening in spatial is you take a piece of tissue and you can kind of barcode it. So the way we really move forward, spatial has been along for a long time, is really barcoding these technologies in order to kind of tease out genome, epigenome, transcriptome, and proteome. I will say from a kind of commercialization of products, the proteome and the transcriptome have come more further along than kind of genome. And this is what it looks like. I just looked at this at the end of, it was published the end of December and it's kind of a daunting task. Um, do we care? I would say that the larger field cares. There's been over 50 technologies that have launched since 2014. And again, back to that, DNA, RNA, and protein situation, most of it's been an RNA, um, protein starting to come up, but DNA really hasn't had the same momentum. And that's largely um, probably from the depth of having to go after all the DNA, um, which is a larger, big, like a, a much bigger task. So what we really wanted to do now is take that, um, that gene regulatory network and we applied it both to single cell data, so trying to identify the cell clusters themselves and then really mapping them into the developing human brain. So I'm, for sake of time, I'm passing all through this, but we kind of explain the, the yeast one hybrid network. So that's a transcription factors binding onto it. We also took single cell and um, ATAC data and we found from CHIP-seq of 1500 CHIP-seq experiments um, from roadmap kind of predictive transcription factor binding sites. 
So we have this kind of larger gene regulatory network that now in, from single cell attack data, we're going to try and map into the developing human brain. So we did this by taking kind of punches of the brain in regions that we know are being affected by these disorders. So I'm gonna concentrate um, mainly on the prefrontal cortex because it's a lot of data, um, but you can see here's all the punches and this is kind of the first layer of Visium. So over here is kind of that punch of the prefrontal cortex. So for those in the group that don't know what Visium, Visium is essentially a barcoded um, technology where you put this on a slide and there's 5,000 dots. And so those dots are barcoded and we make libraries of them. If you were to take that prefrontal cortex and put it into kind of their space ranger, you would get this beautiful kind of clustering of maybe six clusters that would separate out the brain. So this would be kind of the progenitor zone. This is what we know even from h &E staining would be the subventricular zone. And this is where uh, neurons differentiate. So here are kind of stem cell neurons, they go through this process and then they differentiate when they hit the outer cortex. So what we really wanted to do was, this was not really that fascinating to us in terms of we could probably see most of this um, just by h &E and then describing it with some um, RNA-seq data. We, what we really did was harness the ability of our single cell data to really give us more resolution in the Visium data set. So you can see here um, that we have kind of all these cell populations for the people that are not brain people. Um, it's okay, you don't need to know what they are, but what you can see is that we can differentiate them out into kind of a few glutaminergic cell populations, cycling cells. What was really interesting to us is when we were able to map that, this is kind of the mapped data of the single cell. So on the right-hand side over here, well, you can see if you were to take this purple zone, it's, it's called kind of um, the neuroprogenitor zone, right? So we would normally in um, kind of spatial data look at this by SOX2 markers and say, okay, well, these are stem cell-like. But what's really interesting about the single cell data when you map it here is that there's far more cell populations here than we would have projected from the single cell because we wouldn't, uh, they're an being annotated by their RNA-seq data alone. So there's a lot, lot more intermingling of cells here in the um, progenitor zone than we would have anticipated. The same happens true over kind of as it differentiates. By H&E, we kind of only see this as kind of one big layer. And what you can see here is that we can really start to subdivide these into maybe three or four or five layers. And what does that mean? So if you look very individualistically across all those single cell populations, you have a more clear idea of kind of how I was describing these. So again, here's the cycling progenitor zone. What you can see in the subventricular zone, it's really being defined by many different cell types, right? So um, if you look here, you kind of see a glutaminergic cell, um, you see different glutaminergic cell populations that line very early up in the subventricular zone and very late. These are like the last cells before you become a differentiated cortex. Yet these glutaminergic neurons are only ever seen once you've differentiated, you've touched the outside and you've become. And interestingly, right, because here we're just thinking, oh, you're born. Neuron, these glutaminergic neurons are actually quite intermixed. So you see them very, very early on when they start to get out of that um, progenitor zone, they actually turn off in that kind of middle zone of the subventricular zone and they start to turn back on. So how do we relate this, these kind of, now we have cell clusters, right? The coolest part about this is they're not just little, that kind of like um, pink cell cluster over here with a green cell cluster over here. We can really start to see where they are and who they interact with. And how did we use that in the context of this amazing um, gene regulatory network? So what we could do is overlap, this is the live effort of overlapping essentially single cell um, ATAC data, single nuc ATAC data, single nuc RNA-seq data, our functional yeast one hybrid screen, um, as well, and this single nuc ATAC data also has CHIP-seq um, calls in it, and that Visium spatial data. And what you can see when we overlap that is we actually found these seven master transcription factors across neurodevelopmental disorder. And we know that likely these are very real because these are known transcription factors that are involved in brain development. So one, it's a positive in control. So if you look over here, TCF4, we actually just describe it as a master transcription factor because it's just on all of the time during um, development of the brain. But what you can see even in this one, which we'll go into later, there is still a spatial organization to it. 
What's really interesting is one of them is FOXP1. FOXP1 is the speech gene, right? So we know this only exists in humans. And what if you look spatially, it literally lines up kind of that subventricular zone, the very right before you become a neuron. And we can predict its regulome. So by using um, chip seek calls of FOXP2, we can say, like, who do you talk to? And the people they talk to, so when FOXP2, FOXP1 goes on, all the people it talks to goes off in the next zone. And kind of the opposite tr is true for this kind of transcription factor. So MEF2C is on in that entire subventricular zone. It starts to go on really highly, more highly as it hits the edge. And what you can see is all the things that it regulates are in its own area. So when it's high, it, its regulation of things is high, but it almost needs to be turned on to deregulate these genes. So we found these seven things. Do we think they're real? And what did they tell us that we didn't, we wouldn't have seen before? So I wanted to kind of walk you through a little bit of TCF4. So again, you remember I said that TCF4 is a master transcription factor. Um, we see it as an actual syndrome. So if you knock this gene out, you actually end up with this disorder, uh, Pitt Hopkins syndrome. It's a neural development disorder. It has features that kind of overlap with um, features of autism. So they have developmental delay, but in addition to that, they have breathing problems. So if you knock out TCF4, it's likely expressed in other organs as well. It's actually what this picture depicts is that it's actually a GWAS hit in schizophrenia is now considered an autism gene as well. So if you hit it a little bit, right? So what GWAS tells you is that it's not a pure obliteration of the gene, that it is likely involved in the risk of schizophrenia. And this one actually is kind of our gene regulatory network. So what was really interesting from this is not only was it a seed to our network, but it was one of the top transcription factors that we found from the yeast one hybrid screen. So I always like to go back and we we're talking a lot today about multi-omics is like everybody, when they come talk to me, wants to do single cell and spatial stuff, but we learn a lot from kind of the data that's already out there, how to mine the data and what does bulk RNA-seq tell us? So we went back to that Allen brain data and this is kind of because it's such a profound data set, it goes through developmental time across many patients. What you can see here, this is the cortex. So this is the region by which we punched that one punch I showed you. And what you can see is obviously TCF4 is just blaring. It's turned on all of the time, but it has this beautiful striation pattern. It's kind of, it has really higher expression here, but it turns off a little bit. And what we could see in the bulk data that we never saw in the single cell data is that it had a reciprocal expression of this transcription factor, SOX9, beautifully. So every time TCF4 is off, so in the red here, it's strikingly really on in SOX9. So when we look at our single cell data, right, now we pulled out TCF4, we know TCF4 is a transcript, master transcription factor. We would have normally ignored it because it's kind of just expressed everywhere. So when you look at these plots, it's not really telling you any given space or place that TCF4 has some specificity. And even in SOX9, maybe if you look at SOX9, you might see this cell population and be like, oh, maybe that's kind of cool. But when we look spatially, we were able to actually, I don't show the statistics, but we were able to show that every place that TCF4 is, present, is absent, SOX9 is on. And again, we don't even know what's happening there, right? So you see all these little dark dots, right, in TCF4. There's not a lot of them, but all of them are really being lit up in SOX9. So it really speaks to single cell data alone won't tell us that. Bulk's RNA-seq data kind of hinted at it. And spatially, we were able to localize them to places in the brain that we think may be important for the kind of the reciprocity of this relationship. And how are we thinking about this data moving forward? So what I really wanted to show the resolution of this data really comes from the single cell and that's how we're harnessing it. So now we're really deep into the computation of it. And we can tell you even in those dots, the proportion of kind of the single cell. Um, and what we're really trying to do now is build them out, right? So what you can see here is this cell is completely different from the surrounding cells. And why do these cells that are mainly composed of glutaminergic neurons, why are they all kind of clustered together in the screen cells alone? And what we can do from this data, because now we have RNA-seq data, is now we're starting to look at um, kind of perturbations into the DNA. And so one of the things we're looking at is really looking at copy number, because we know that there's a lot of neurodevelopmental disorders that stop with copy number mutations. And we can see that from RNA-seq, because what you're really doing in RNA-seq, you start to see um, transcriptomes that start and suddenly revert and have different kind of copy numbers in this area that might be a place by which um, 
the, the deletion or the duplication is having an effect. And we're really doing this from an AI approach, which I'll talk about later. So really just taking kind of um, the approach of, of putting into these machine learning models that need a lot of data input, um, single cell data to try and kind of get an idea of an agnostic approach because the limitation of the single cell data is that we have to annotate it. So we have to have a presumed idea of what we think the red cell is gonna be. So I kind of walked you through this Goliath tour of kind of brain development, but I wanted to shift gears to kind of, um, to talk about other diseases. Cause what I really am interested in is the idea that not all disease looks the same. And even the outcome of disease doesn't look the same. So not only do we have genetic perturbations where a woman may have BRCA1, never get breast cancer, but another woman may have ovarian cancer or breast cancer. And a man with a BRCA2 mutation may have prostate cancer. And so one of the data sets that I'll be talking about next is how are we applying kind of these methods that we've already learned in the brain to other disease pathogenesis. So I'm really honored to be part of um, the Human Cell Atlas for their ancestry. And so um, we're really looking at in the first Human Cell Atlas, we've kind of missed certain populations across the globe in terms of who uh, the cells that we're collecting from. So this is a larger consortium. Um, it's called the African Caribbean Cancer Consortium. And so we have about 32 sites across the globe um, where we collect kind of cells of origin for breast, prostate, and ovarian cancer doing single cell methods. And the reason that we're really in, um, interested in this is not just to add to the human cell atlas, but also from a biological and outcome um, interest. And so I'm only going to walk you through breast cancer, but across African ancestry. So across, so your ancestry is African, but you've migrated to the Caribbean or you've migrated to the U.S. Um, and what we can see across all cancer types is a different incidence and mortality based on where you first started and where you ended up. And so really walking you through specifically breast. So what we see in um in women who are of U US black women, we see that they have kind of a very high incidence, right? But they don't very much die of um, breast cancer. And we think that's likely treatment or that we have better hospitals. And so that's always been a really big underlying problem and criticism of the field um, because it, it might just be access that we're seeing kind of this ancestry effect. Because what you see over here is that there's lower incidence in Africa, but the women do much poorer. And what's really kind of heightened and straddled this entire um, field, and the, mainly this consortium, is this really interesting population of um, Caribbean Black. So Caribbean Black is a very admixed population, right? There's Latino, um, there is uh, Southeast Asian. So what you really see in these disorders, they have kind of the same idea where they have limited access. So are you, are you dying more in Africa because of, uh, you have lower incidence, but are you dying more because of the access to care? Well, across socioeconomic status, they're likely more equivocal. And yet, despite that, we're in Black women that they are definitely having a more aggressive disease, independent of access to healthcare. So we were really interested in kind of using um, this existing infrastructure of kind of we are already profiling them for single cell is really to start to look at their tumors. Um, so this is a, it's a global workflow and it's really being head by um, Dr. George out of U University of Miami Healthcare Systems. And what they've been able to do as a larger group is start these sites. And what we really wanted to do was also empower the sites themselves. Um, so the surgical re resection occurs at the site, whether that's in Africa, the Caribbean or the US. Um, we try across sites to share clinical information. And what we're trying right now is to also have pathology for diagnostics across both sites, do the data acquisition and processing in the US, and hopefully transfer the computation um, back to the site location. Because these technologies that we really talk about across this multi-omic conference, we're really talking about health di disparity. They're really hard to get into kind of these lower middle income environments. So how do we do that in a way by which we're sharing the data back and teaching them as well? So the way we've done this is it's been really pathologist driven. Um, we're lucky to have Dr. Modisho, who is um, a pathologist in Nigeria. He now works um, and is doing his PhD in U Miami because he's so inspired. Um, and really um, uh, we have a partnership with uh, Akoya who's helped us develop uh, our very first 
It's the very first triple negative breast cancer panel of 66 antibodies. Um, and this is done um, through a Goliath effort of Nadia. So for anybody in the audience that does IHT, you can imagine what it is to put 66 conjugated antibodies together. And um, we've really broken it down based on having about six pathologists who do clinical diagnostics. So there's clinical diagnostic antibodies that we wanted to see. We also asked them, what would you like to add? And then we also probed our single cell um, breast data set to really fine tune kind of the markers that we put in. And so in this system, what you actually have to do is take your favorite antibody, you conjugate it, you do some QC and antibody validation. We took those women across the, in this case, we'll be talking about US black women and Caribbean women. Um, what really would be in this system, unlike the Visium system, so we were using FFP blocks and um, we put it on their Akoya machine. And so we did this data acquisition. Essentially, what is it? This machine allows you to toss on the antibodies. You'll see he down here, it cycles through imaging all those antibodies and then collapses them. So essentially, we can 66 plex on the exact same tissue. And then we put it through some data analysis and computation that I'll be talking about next. So does it work? Um, we're really excited to say not only does it work in tumors, but this is really crucial in kind of um, the types of samples that are truthful in the real world situation is biopsies. So I've purposely shown here a needle biopsy. Um, and so we see in a needle biopsy that even if I'm a baseline immune marker in an epithelial um, environment, so in this case, it's CD45 and E. cadherin, you can see very visually, right, not just in single cell data that we see, but visually we can see that there's a lot more different composition. And because we have the plexity, right, now we have 66 markers, we can start to see them the same way that you analyze single cell data. We can find, end we can find markers when you combine, you know, these markers together, you can identify an endothelial cell marker, T cell types, myelinoid cell types, and epithelial cell types. And not only can we find um, epithelial cell types, we can also differentiate between the normal and kind of tumor cells. But we saw things that we could not see in our single cells. So here's just a beautiful picture. And I like to see the pictures because I think that's where spatial really is moving the field forward. Is we talk a lot in single cell data about trying to get CAFs, right? This cancer associated fibroblasts. I will tell you fibroblasts in a droplet system and also in a single cell system don't like to make a droplet as much as epithelial cells. So our single cell data is kind of biased, but spatially you can kind of see these beautiful architectures um, of the CAFs kind of in the tumor itself. So once we do that, we take all of these cell types, you can see kind of, we see the same thing that we can see in single cell data, where we cannot start to assign the cell types to all the cells. This is a Goliath task. I will tell you that it's 4 million cells, right? So I can assign all of this, but now I have the power of 4 million cells from this slide data. And so I just wanted to highlight um, Dr. Ben Sheik, who also works at Akoya, who helped us um, to really annotate all of these cells but then from those annotations, now we're really able to ask, quantify and say like, who is talking to who and what are they doing? Are there different, are there, is there differences between the US black women and the Caribbean black women based on kind of the assignments and who, um, what types of cells they're expressing? So I can tell you, yes, that is absolutely true. You can break that down and just kind of look at these cell components. You can see that graphically over here. And we can show you just by eye that there's different compositional um, between the US black women and the Caribbean black women. And what's really interesting is you see a new immune phenotype kind of emerge in the Caribbean black women. So they kind of have this more kind of ma macrophage um, and a lot more proliferating T cells, which we'll talk about right here. So this is a tumor. I like to show this one too. You can see just by tumors, the B cells here are very quite different than um, the tumor cells. And when we break it down in terms of um, proportions, what you should be able to see kind of from these kind of um, overall views, right? So don't get so much into the cell annotations. There's just different ways by which the US black women have cell compositions compared to the Caribbean women. We, this single cell analysis is kind of limited because we always wanna go back to look at the tissue, right? But we can see here is we actually have way more proliferating um, we have different kind of Treg, so their Treg composition is different in US black women compared to Caribbean women. So I kind of broke this down to just the immune system alone so we can kind of see a better view of that. So if you take the US black and the Caribbean black women, 
what I was trying to tell you and to mark there is that there's more T regs in the US black. Um, you can actually also see kind of this breakdown in M1, M2 macrophages. There's a lot more M1, M2 macrophages around to kind of help out these tumors. Um, and we can even take deep dives into not even just seeing the macrophages. So in this case, the macrophages are in blue. We can actually see how they talk to kind of the purple cells around them, which are part one cells. So we can actually, we're hoping to, and we'll end with this um, in a little bit, but we're hoping to kind of see if this has any um, implications in terms of clinical um, diagnostic treatments uh, treatments as well. So now I, I'm telling you there's different cell compositions. What does that mean? Because we still want to take into account the spatial data. So we have all these cell types at the bottom. Um, and what we really want to ask is if you are a B cell, who do you most talk to? If you are proliferating T cell, right? I'm, I'm showing you those calves. Like who do you normally be around? Um, so we can kind of take that whole data set, which is 4 million cells, and establish these kind of um, cell neighborhoods. So let's say in this cell neighborhood, it's mainly being defined by only tumor cells. But in this cell neighborhoods that are hanging out around tumor cells and hanging around macrophages. And so what we really see kind of in um, here is that we actually see a breakdown in how the African-Americans, so now we can quantify those things that I was showing you just by slides, that you can really see that this neighborhood here, so cell neighborhood number five, literally um, looks very different proportionally wise. And here, cell neighborhood 10 doesn't exist in the other um, population. Um, we also, I'm gonna end with this because I'm running out of time, but we can um, do predictions of kind of these cancer stem cells. So the idea now is like, we can really take into account um, just by sheer looking at the tissues that where do the cancer cells live and where do the cancer stem cell niches um, occur? Cause we know that has to do with outcome. So this has been a, a collaboration with a group in Brazil where they took a machine learning approach with the TCGA, so the tumor, the cancer genome atlas. And what were they able to do with this machine learning approach is link kind of RNA-seq data to outcome. So we've taken that into our single cell data. We can predict which of the single cell data have a more stemness aggressive. So how do you make, how do you take this and say, what are actually gonna be oncogenic features? And we can actually link that to clinical subtypes. So not only is our stem able to identify certain cells in the single cell data, we actually can identify more aggressive disease. So in this case, most of our stem is in kind of triple negative disease um, as opposed to the other diseases. And I'm gonna let end with this because what does that matter? Well, I'll tell you when you're working with 4 million cells and you're trying to say who talks to who, it gets to to be a little bit biased in terms of the cell ends. Um, and what I'd love for you to see is there's a major difference in terms of kind of that stemness prediction in US black women. So they're not as STEMI, right? STEMI in blue is where it's not STEMI. Meaning the stemness is typical outcome um, is when you see these profiles, those these areas are less aggressive than the other areas. And what you can see in the Caribbean black women who again, remembering have they have the worst outcome and the most aggressive disease, we have a large portion of those high STEM populations. And that high STEM population links back to the spatial data that we had talked about earlier. We see these myoepithelial cells. Um, we see where the helper T cells and macrophages are very quiet for stemness. So the biology really marks the, the stemness. And so we really think that the future of spatial will really kind of help with treatment alterations, right? So what I am ending with is, is it an uh, ancestry thing? Can we learn from this into the clinical realm of treatment? Um, and so this is kind of a beautiful picture of those macrophages and the PARP1 phenotype, right? So, you know, remembering that these women go on, um, some of these women go on PD-1, um, some go on PARP inhibitors. And really now we're gonna be able to look at cells and see whether they're responding to PARP themselves. Do they express PARP? Um, so in this case, like PARP inhibitors are recommended for HER2 cancer. If you don't see PARP1 ce PARP cells there, how would an inhibitor actually work on that woman? So we really think the spatial will help us get to that realm. And I was asked now um, that I'm finally out of time is um, to give kind of an overview of where I think the field is and kind of in the context of everything that you guys have kind of discussed. Now you come back from lunch, um, you're going to start to network and you're going to start to think about like, I gave this big talk with a lot of data. 
but how can I incorporate this? In, so how can you guys incorporate this into your own experiments? So I think we're gonna shift kind of from that beginning part of my talk where it's a less of an Atlas approach and now kind of applying these atlases that people like myself have been generating more into the biology of kind of the samples that you're thinking about. I also think that kind of we really have to harness the amount of single cell data that we have and we're gonna be seeing a lot of more of that single cell into tissue. It's gonna be really fun to see the mechanism of that because with the single cell data, we can get into things like functional genomics and, not, and do CRISPR knockouts. And really what I highlighted in this um, talk, but what I think everybody in this room is highlighting is really the integration. So that multi-omic approach to the spatial data. And, and we will require broadening of teams. So this is something that becomes very interesting when you start to look into the spatial data. I didn't think that a, half of my time would be spent with pathologists or cell connectivity experts, right? So when you look at neurons, there are these people that stay far away from genomics, but it matters what neuron talks to who. Um, and with all this kind of technology advancement in both the resolution, the plexing, kind of sequencing based, I think is gonna make a lot more momentum, um, is really thinking if you're a PhD, PhD or postdoc in this room is to really think about the computational bottlenecks that we're all facing, including in my lab. Um, so my lab, I'm really thinking about making it um, more computation than laboratory because we will not be able to keep up with the data. And so we think about incorporating computation into your training. Um, so I'll stop there and just acknowledge the people for the neurodevelopmental work. Um, so people at C my previous um, place was Cedars. Um, my um, postdoc mentor was Pat Levitt. Um, the East One Hybrid Screen was done with Dr. Marion Walhout, um, and access to tissues was from this larger group. And then a big acknowledgement to this large consortium who have sites everywhere and the people that did the work for this. So thank you very much. <laughs>